it can be extremely dangerous underground. Uh, just a little thing, like when we're, you're working in a shaft, you have multiple platforms usually. And if someone drops, like drops their hammer or something, if it falls and lands on somebody's head, you can be, have major injuries. So it's so much more dangerous working underground than it is, say, working on a street corner or something like that or doing your house. Because if you trip and fall, you can get killed on our job, where on the street, you know, you stub your toe, big deal. So it, it definitely is, a, is an awakening experience every now and then. In, in, I'm surprised more people haven't been hurt. Um, it amazes me. I, I feel God looks out for small children, animals, and, and sandhawks because we've had a, some amazing things that have happened in the tunnel where they happened just after the man trip left. So that, like there's 30 guys on the man trip, it just left when something happens. Or we had another thing where it was coffee break time. All the guys left for coffee break and something happened where they had just been standing. They were all at coffee break when, when, when we lost the form. It's just amazing how many close calls there are. And God must be watching the tunnel people. It, it's, it's amazing. Well, uh, we're excavating the shaft for the water tunnel, and uh, it's wet, damp. It's my living conditions on the job. <laughs> my intentions was to work in this business long enough to buy a new car, and evidently I didn't buy it yet. 27 years later, so <laughs> you know uh, the, 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 the pay scale is good. And uh, I like it because it's, it's like uh, you have more or less uh, job freedom, you know. You're not confined in, uh, to one area all the time. And, uh, uh, you know, you move into different locations. And uh, it's a new adventure, each job is, you know. Uh, well, I'm the foreman. And uh, my job is to make sure the job gets done. <laughs> it's mostly on-the-job training. You know, you learn as you work. And, uh, you know, after I got involved uh, in this work uh, and I decided to make a career out of it, I, I put forth my best effort and I learned what I could, you know. And uh, I think that uh, if any person, if they intend to do something, you might as well do good, you know. I, I mean, you have, in every industry there is, I guess, you have people that just go to work to get a paycheck and they don't make any advances, you know. But uh, once I decided to uh, stay in this business, then uh, I decided to do a good job. At first, it was just a car. <laughs> now it's a career, you know. We, we have to uh, blast the rock out first. We were, first we drilled, uh, you see the drill, we have a drill over here, a big, big uh, jumbo drill. We use that, we drill holes and we blast it and we use the uh, muck machine to excavate.
and then we take the concrete form down, which is the steel structured form used for holding the concrete when we pour it in the shaft. And then we pour it. We uh, then have to break the form, which we did today, take it all the way back to the bottom and start disassembling it. And that's basically what we did all day today. My job is to uh, protect the heads of the men in the hole, make sure nothing falls on them, make sure everything you know, goes down right, and there's no problems between the top and the bottom, and keep a line of communications open with them all the time. So the main job is protect their heads. I've seen a couple of loads get out of hand a little bit and start swinging in the shaft you know, and bounce off the walls a little bit, but uh, other than that, I haven't had no real scary ones and I don't want to have any. You know, there's been enough that I've seen in my past that uh, like to keep it safe every day. <laughs> the water tunnel is something that, that people don't really know that much about. They don't see it and it's, it's not something that's, uh, that's evident. If they turned that tap on one day and the water didn't come out in a city like this, the uh, results would be uh, disastrous. The tunnel that we've been working on since 68, Water Tunnel 3, is uh, is, is a proud thing for the hogs, you know. We, uh, we've we lost a lot of men building, building it. There's probably, I think there's, they're in the high 20s now, the number of people who have died on it, but uh, it's something that the city couldn't survive without. I guess it's ultimately around 600 feet, and it's a uh, 28-foot elliptical on top, and then you got about 150 foot of 26-foot, uh, and then you got the remaining shaft 20-foot in diameter. I'm in the business 26 years. Um, 1973, a big rock come down, broke my back. I was in the hospital uh, six weeks. I was out of work three months. Had a drill steel go through my foot one time, you know. It's, it's, it's tough work and it's, uh, it's dangerous, you know, and you gotta respect it all the time. And uh, we earn our money. I like it. It's the only thing I know. I brought my family up, bought my homes, and uh, I'm going to retire with a decent amount of money. Cut that right. Stick it right through your chest. How you doing? Then tell them who's going to do the work in the home. Same to you. Third generation said, huh? Third shaft. Dennis, Dennis is no mystery. He's just uh, he's a hardworking, uh, very good shaft man. He brings he's, in the last over the last years he's probably brought the most shafts down. Uh, very knowledgeable, you know, and I said very safe wise too, you know, and he won't breathe any sigh of relief till we're done drilling out. 
and that big old jumbo comes out of the hole and put back in that cradle, and that phase of the job is done, and he'll smile a little bit more. It's type of stuff that there's certain rules that you don't never break. Like, you know, when you're at the bottom of shaft after a shot, you have to clean the bottom real good. And people think it's, you clean it real good so you can just turn around and see where you're drilling. But in reality, you're cleaning it real well so that you find that there's no hole with an extra stick of powder and a guy goes drilling to and kills himself. And people say, well, we just clean it up. Well, it's not good enough. It's not good enough that you can almost lick it, you know, because there's reasons you do this. And if you start deviating from those golden rules, that's when you start having accidents. And you start taking those chances, you may get away with it. But if you don't get away with it and something does happen, it could be a disaster. And it's something that I've learned from old timers. Two guys in this union that taught me stuff when I was broke in this business. They taught me this is the way to go. And uh, it's like a rule that I've been sticking with. And guys I work around, uh, the miners themselves, you know, they, uh, it's not me that's safe. You know, it's um, the men in the hole. Those are the guys that are down the hole. They're working safe. They know what to do, you know. And one of those guys come down and say, Dennis, you have a bad situation, and I respect you guys, you know, I respect their opinions. You know, I'll go down and look, and if I agree with them, then we'll do it. And if I don't agree with them, 90% of the time I'll do it anyway. The main thing is you come in with six men, or eight men, or ten men, and you go back to the next shop with six men, eight men, or ten men. That's an all intact. That's the main thing, you know. How can we afford this mayor, the opponents would say? I mean, we have all of these uh, uh, demands uh, on uh, city limited dollars that we think are so much more important because they are immediate. And this tunnel uh, won't be delivering water probably during your lifetime, mayor. <laughs> and I said, that's unimportant. That's unimportant. Um, we are part of something unique, and we're going to do our part. First of all, the Department of Environmental Protection is the city's largest capital construction agency. Most people don't think of the environmental agency as the biggest builder, but we are. And this tunnel is, of course, its largest project. It's paid for uh, by 800,000 accounts in the city. Everybody that pays their water bill, their sewer bill, that's what they're paying for. They're paying for the tunnel. And uh, we have a system that's set up to, to float debt, to float bonds, to pay for these long-term capital construction projects. And the interest, the debt service on those bonds are paid by everybody who pays a water bill in New York City. So, that, so this is really being paid for by, by the people, by the, the people who use water in this town. Well, the Water and Sewer Authority came much later, you know. Uh, that was uh, a device uh, that uh, we would be able to use to, for independent uh, raising of dollars in the bond market because the uh, security uh, would be the payments on uh, water made by those who drink. Right? It's an independent uh, source of revenue. But that occurred uh, later on. Uh, and uh, early on, these monies came out, as I recall it, from our regular capital budget. Uh, and that is why uh, many times it would be a, you know, like a, a relatively small amount. Uh, for something like this, $100 million is a small amount. <laughs> but whatever it was that we could do, I said, we will do it. Are going to be your, you when you grow up, and your kids' kids. This is going to last for a long time. So it is right to borrow this money from people who are willing to lend it now and to pay it back over the next 30 years. Or if the water tunnel is going to last for 50 years, over the next 50 years. It's right to do that because few, uh, uh, you know, have a responsibility to pay for the use of this thing. So we borrow. Now you can say, who the heck has $7.6 billion? And I'm gonna go like that. I can get that $7.6 billion like that. This, it's there. It's sitting in people's checking accounts. It's sitting in people's money market funds. It's sitting in their piggy banks. 
And what we do, we now, I'm working for the city. Great, thank you. What we do is uh, we print up a lot of flakes of paper that say on them, pay back $5,000, you know, in the year 2008 or 2015. And in the meantime, pay 6% every year split it up into six month payments every every six months you have three percent and do that for the next 30 years we take those papers those piece of papers and i sell them to my clients on behalf of the city and all of that money comes out of the woodworks because people are only getting four percent now or something less or there it's even in their checking accounts they're getting nothing on it and all of a sudden they're glad to be getting six percent uh they don't need the money for the next 30 years they don't need it ever these are rich people but they love getting the 6% right along. Now, let me tell you kids in this class another little extra. That 6% is, I'll give you the shorthand for it, is tax-free. Well, the, the way the system works, um, we take in the revenues from the, from the water users. Every year we take in something over a billion dollars of revenue. Because you have a stream of income coming to, to this water authority, that allows the water authority to securely float bonds that people will buy and then through the revenues that people pay you'll pay the interest on the bonds so it is a well thought of well respected system as a matter of fact the bonds on the water system are rated much higher than new york city bonds um, but again you have a secure stream of income coming in and so you can finance projects like this uh, well uh, the, in my administration we uh, created uh, that authority uh, so that uh, several things would flow from that. Um, one was that you'd have an independent revenue uh, raising uh, authority. Uh, the Water Board uh, could uh, uh, issue uh, its uh, own bonds uh, separate from the cities. That's number one. Um, two, you uh, would be able to avoid the politics of city council uh, having to uh, vote for legislation that would raise water rates and charges uh, so that uh, every time you had to raise the uh, water charges and the sewer charges you had an enormous political battle uh, even when the members of the council knew that you were right as mayor in urging this they didn't want to do it particularly if it was an election year but if you have an independent uh, board where the people don't run for election, uh, they will do it on the merits. Okay, in 1969, when they let the, the first contracts, when they, when they bid the first contracts for City Tunnel Number 3, Stage 1, they had three separate contracts. They were all won by the same contractor, a joint venture. called They called themselves Water Tunnel Contractors. And at that time, which was the end of 1969, it was the largest single construction contract that in this country that was a, led to a non-defense contract. The cost of stage one, which is 13 miles of tunnel that runs from Hillview Reservoir in Yonkers, through the Bronx, through Manhattan, the west side of Manhattan, down Amsterdam Avenue, cuts across Central Park, and comes through Roosevelt Island and ends up in Astoria, Queens, and includes three large underground chambers that whole project, including valves that you see behind you here and, and the, and the uh, pumps and all the equipment, will probably run very close to a billion dollars. Stage two, which is the, the connection from that tunnel to the Queens Tunnel and then to the Brooklyn Tunnel and also the Manhattan Tunnel, and includes a chamber to be built in Queens, will probably be, again, in the neighborhood of a little over a billion dollars. Stage three and four, which are in the planning stages, uh, will each contain um, a stretch of tunnel. Uh, one going, the stage three will be uh, from Van Cortlandt Park up to Kensico Reservoir and will contain some intermediate shafts. And stage four will be a connection from Van Cortlandt Park chamber with tunnel and shafts, distribution shafts, to the new chamber to be built in Queens. And the estimates I've heard run from a total for all four stages to between five and six billion dollars when they're all completed.
I often, I often think this is my tunnel. And when I was an inspector in the tunnel and we would be pouring concrete, and God, the guys hated me when I was the inspector before the concrete job because I would make them clean every piece of dirt off the rock and all the water off the rock before they could pour concrete. And, you know, come out with your toothbrushes. I don't care. Get that clean before you pour concrete. And they kept telling me why. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And I'm like, yeah, but this has to last 50 or 100 years. I don't want my grandchild to come on this job and say, yep, grandma did that and that messed up. You know, we're going to have to redo that. I want it to last for my great grandchildren. And, uh, this is part of my goal. You know, it's, it's like the Hoover Dam or something like that. It's just, it's, it's an amazing thing that you leave on for future generations. And water for New York City is very important. And we got to get it right the first time. You know, you figure the people who built tunnel number one, tunnel number one is over 80 years old. It, it was built with a 50 year lifespan. Well, obviously they did a very good job building that tunnel because it's still working. You know, and I want them to be able to say that about my job. At the bottom of shaft 23B, which is the work shaft for the Brooklyn Tunnel, we're about 550 feet underground here. We're standing in the tail tunnel, which was uh, excavated by drill and blast and is basically a storage area for equipment. It's a small maintenance area for the locomotives. In the shaft here, you can see the vertical belt and the muck unloading facility. And way out in that direction, about approximately two miles at this point, is where they're actually excavating with the TBM, with the tunnel boring machine. working on the Manhattan Tunnel, once a week there was a guy who worked down there and uh, I would bring in lunch for him one week and then the next week he would bring in lunch for me and one week, every, that one day of the week, we would sit on a pipe next to the, uh, <clears throat> the water that was running down the uh, middle of the track and we would make believe we were having a picnic next to a stream and uh, it's like you can, it, it can be an enjoyable place like that. that many women around or something like that but um, I have honestly found that from when I was going to school or when I started um, work that uh, there were an awful lot of people you know an awful lot of men that were willing to help you know they, they thought it was wonderful that um, that I was interested in getting into this field the fact that I'm a female I think as far as I'm concerned, has sort of dissipated um, years ago. And I don't really think of it as being that unusual, that different. And, um, you know, I know there are obvious differences that, you know, never are the same. I don't share locker rooms or this or that, or, 
you know, it's mostly a male uh, hog house. I generally, you know, I stay out of there if I know they're changing clothes, things like that. But as far as, you know, my authority here, things like that, I don't think it's really a factor. What? Trying to fit a, <laughs> trying to fit a 19 foot machine in an 18 foot hole. <laughs> you know, when I was growing up, some people hear stories about um, whatever field their family is interested in, whether it's farming or this, that I always heard stories about mining, you know, from my grandmother. I guess when I was in high school, um, you know, I liked science. I had a facility for science and math. Then when I went to college, um, I decided to study earth sciences and geology. And then I decided to go back and get a master's degree. And when I got a master's degree in was mining engineering, it was offered at, you know, Columbia University here in New York. And uh, I went for a master's and actually one year beyond a master's. I could have gone for a PhD, but I thought I was getting too um, theoretical and I enjoy, you know, practical things. There was actually an ad in the New York Times for a civil engineer. And uh, I called for the interview and, um, you know, I went for an interview and they said, well, do you want to work in construction? Uh, do you want to work underground? And I really didn't know what I was getting myself in for. And I said, sure, sure, you know. <laughs> so, um, the first day I went underground, I, you know, it was a, an obviously um, unusual experience and it was not like anything that I had expected. Well, it's hard to remember the first time I ever went down the tunnel because after a while it just becomes so routine. But, <clears throat> well, I think one of the most memorable things was we were walking maybe two miles underground, two, three miles underground, um, through this, you know, blasted rock with steel. It was, uh, you know, <laughs> you basically had to watch where you were going, otherwise you'd fall. But it, uh, when I got to where they were actually working, there was the steel floor, which was called the sliding floor. And when I looked up, there was a three-story drilling machine with approximately, I think it was like seven very high-powered drills going at the same time. The noise was absolutely deafening. I had never seen anything like this in my life. And I, for the first time, I didn't watch where I was going. And what I did was I fell flat on my face <laughs> on the steel floor. And I was covered with muck. And the sand hog came over, Stewie. And he took me by the arm. He sat me down. He got out some paper towels and cleaned me off. Well, actually, he kissed me on the cheek and asked me if, if I would marry him. And then, <laughs> um, and, you know, said, welcome to the tunnel. You know, so <laughs> uh, proud to have been chosen as resident engineer for this job. Um, I like the idea of building something concrete that's going to last and be useful. Uh, I think the what the engineers who designed the system about a hundred years ago, what they were able to accomplish um, is something that I'm proud to continue because it was really an engineering feat to build what they built. You know, most New Yorkers don't realize how much uh, they rely on it and how much they need, you know, the water supply system and what an engineering marvel it is.
specialized work as far as I'm concerned. And there's a lot to learn. And people, when you talk to people about it, they seem to be a little more interested. It's not an everyday job. But the men that I work with, I, I enjoy comradeship. Everybody's basically equal. There's no uh, looking down on anybody else. And that's basically why I like it. It's interesting. So you keep an open mind. If you work here long enough, you know it could be safe. As long as you keep an open mind and see what's going on around you, you don't get lackadaisy. Fractured wrist, fractured knee, uh, hurt my back, stuff in my eyes. Uh, I imagine everybody in this business has a, one sort of injury. He can relate to the job. We try to keep it to a minimum. That's why we try to keep experienced men out here that know what, you know, know what they're doing. It's on a job training, like I said, you can't, they don't have a school for this. Well, well, where we are now, maybe we're approximately, oh, 300 yards from the shaft, the access to the tunnel coming down. From that, from the point we are now, the mold started molding, actually cutting the rock, maybe 200 yards. I'm a member of Local 14, which is Operating Engineers. We operate heavy equipment all throughout New York and the country. Um, I'm very proud to be an operating engineer. And uh, sand hogs aren't the only people down in the tunnel. Uh, my position is a TBM operator, which is a tunnel bore machine operator. And I run the machine downstairs. Okay, the TBM is in the part of the tunnel which is called the heading, which is the very beginning of the tunnel. I talk to the man in the back of the machine, who's a loading man. He gives me the sirens and the bells to take off and we start going. Um, once the bells sound, the motors get turned on and it starts rumbling away. The material comes out, which is granite. We, we're mining through granite now. Comes out on the belts, dumps into the trains. Every six feet, we just redo everything again. We travel six feet at a time. TBM is uh, the new technology for making tunnels. Before this machine was invented, it was drilling and blasting as drilling holes, stuffing it with dynamite, and blowing the holes out. This is modern technology where you're laser guided, um, it's hydraulically operated with electricity, hydraulic, and um, material comes out onto trains. It's a lot more advanced. It's very loud down there, very dusty down there. We wear uh, respirators, and everybody wears air protection all day long. You can't be claustrophobic in this type of job. There's a lot of camaraderie downstairs. Guys, we joke around a lot, but when the job has to get done, it gets done. This is where the mold works. This is the finished product. The rock bolts that are up here go all the way into the face. It's a safety precaution. Just in case there is a bad seam, it will hold the rock up. A bad seam in the rock, where it might be loose, <clears throat> might be porous. It's up to individual miner who are trained to do that. They see that and they put up extra uh, safe, safety precautions with those steel straps and rock bolts. Over here. And what they do is they take the different layers of rock and you stick either a solid pipe or a, or a pressure pipe into them and they hold the different layers of rock together. Yeah, it could be a toothpick and a club sandwich, but uh, with glue around it. Like you stick Elmer's glue in with the toothpick and stick your sandwich together. My education in Russia also was involved with concrete. That's why I was very happy that I got my job by my spe speciality and I, I can do it and I, I knew what I was doing and that's why I felt in one way that I was sure in myself and another way I wasn't sure because my English was terrible but um, I think it was okay but and I was really proud of myself that I like I had to prove that women can do the same job as a man because like concrete truck will come and all of these truck drivers look at you and I was younger and, and like what what it is girl will tell us concrete is rejected and it's like thousand of dollars which is not good for them like they have to lose money on that how it come that women can send us away or, or whatever but 
Well, it took some time in order like to, well, to prove myself that I know what I'm, I'm doing and sometimes I even was crying. We have the best concrete, the best concrete in whole city, which we put in uh, our uh, water tunnel. It's uh, uh, had um, many awards for the best concrete and I'm really proud that I'm part of uh, this uh, job too, because like, uh, 19B got award um, well this year, well 1994, and before we had award for concrete uh, for best concrete in the city, it's a CIB, CIB concrete industry board awarded it. It was like for 2B project. It it's really very nice to feel that uh, you're doing something and it's really good. Bosses or our lab um, make design mix in order to find out by specification what kind of concrete we have to have um, from our batch plant. After that we have like batch plant inspectors, it's a anybody who is field inspector can be batch plant inspector. They go on a batch plant and they watch it like a right amount of uh, all of the in ingredients like sand, stone, water, admixture, uh, going in a truck and after that uh, they take it to in the field, they mix it in, well, they mix it on a batch plant also, they put partially water, not all the water in order, like, and they agitate, bring it in the field, and after that they have batch plant ticket, which you, uh, uh, look how much you put for uh, every cubic yards of concrete, how much cement, um, uh, in the city tunnel number, number three, we use like two aggregates, one and a half inch stone and three quarter inch stone, uh, like we put in, in uh, right amount of this aggregates, you put right amount of stone for one cubic yards. Usually like like batch um, uh, um, truck is like usually 12 cubic yards. Sometimes we had like 15 cubic yards, but sometimes like through bridge you can take 15 cubic yards, you take a truck like 12 cubic yards. And you look how much uh, ingredient you, you have and how much water because uh, it's very important water cement ratio of concrete because it gives you uh, strengths because strengths of concrete depend on water cement ra ratio mostly and well by design mix you calculate how much you can put in order to have strengths like of specified strengths for our tunnel like 4500 psi in 28 days. <laughs> I'm a payroll liaison. I uh, primary function is uh, as a payroll supervisor. I supervise timekeepers and other payroll employees. Um, I make sure people get paid on time. <laughs> I would say I'm more like supportive, a support cast. Right, the guys are working in the field, in the hole, in the tunnels, and whatever. I take care of, make sure they overtime. They're being paid make sure the um, the family needs that they may not be away from their family for X amount of hours and they're not the little, the little nuances that they're not able to take care of. I'm able, the pair, the wife will be able to contact me and have little problems solved that they're not able to be there to take care of those type of problems. Oh, for me it's very gratifying to help someone, uh, you know, with a problem, for example, for example, many times employees have their, their relatives call me to resolve a problem. Maybe a retiree move away to Florida and I'm the only contact they have with getting proper health insurance or having a pension problem resolved and they'll see me and I'll just, you know, contact pension, have that problem resolved, have to get the check in the mail, you know, take care of uh, the personal problem. It could be also a health related problem, someone sick in the hospital or something. Since I'm on the job and I'm familiar with the problems, I'm better able to um, get proper medical care to them or, or assist in getting medical care to them.